Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. We have a great episode for you today. We're going to get into a little bit on the history of sports team uniforms uh, because we are a sports jersey dispatch. And also our friend Joe Ziemba visits and talks about one of his great Chicago White Sox players of all time, Minnie Minosa. This and more coming up in just a moment. It's an educational trip, and I'm taking you with me day by day, player by player, uniform by uniform. The Sports Jersey Dispatch. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Me day by day, player by player, uniform by uniform. The Sports Jersey Dispatch. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my sports history friends. This is Darren Hayes of the Pigskin Dispatch and Sports Jersey Dispatch, and thought it would be just a great time to bring this to you from the pig pen, your portal to great sports history, uh, to talk about the history of jersey numbers. Now, we talk about the Sports Jersey Dispatch here. We are covering all these great events and players by their jersey numbers and their uniforms that they wore. But maybe we ought to give a little bit of background on the history of jersey numbers. So, as first recorded, the use of numbers on jerseys belongs to our friends from New Zealand and Australia. The first formal use was during the late 1890s during rugby matches in those two countries on the other side of the world. The author Timothy P. Brown on his Fields of Friendly Strife website claims that the American football may have performed the numerable dormant as first in North America. Brown's September 2021 article claims that Amos Alonzo Stagg thought about putting numbers on the University of Chicago players around 1900, but he rescinded the idea when he worried that maybe it would make the scouting of his players by the opponents that much easier. You know, if they knew they had a star running back and he was number 12, well, they would know, you know, key on number 12. Just the thought of the day. We seems uh, very silly for us to think that way today because we know that's what people do and you can still beat them even though they know that's the key on. Well, a Thanksgiving Day collegiate game in 1905, though, between Iowa State and Drake did have unique numbers on the participants. The article says that the numbers were painted on pieces of canvas that had been sewn on the jersey back of each player in a game. 50 numbered shirts were provided, with Drake using the first 25 numbers and then Iowa State using the remaining numbers of 26 through 50 for their players. The digits were displayed prominently on player jerseys to identify them from the other players so that spectators, game scores, and officials could easily recognize who was wearing the jersey. In the early days of its use, there was order in its implementation. In soccer or association football, the players were made to wear the numbers 1 to 11 with the goalie being number 1 and so on. In baseball, the number most often corresponded to the order of the batting position of the player, their batting order. You know, if you're up first, you were number 1, second, 2, clean up, you're number 4. In American football, it was often the case of the best player having the lowest number. So wearing a jersey number one on the gridiron was a prestigious honor indeed in that era for that team. It means your teammates thought you were the best player, or at least your coach or whoever gave out that jersey assignments. Today, however, the players are oftentimes allowed to choose their own number, as long as the number has not been retired and no one else on the team uses that particular number. And many sports like football, your number pertains to your position, so you have a range of numbers. Most levels of American football range numbers based on the player's position, so the digits they select are a bit more limited than other sports. Here's a basic list of when each major sport uh, first used numbers on the shirts, sweaters, or uniforms of the players. 
In the 1890s, like we discussed, Australian and New Zealand rugby teams. 1905, American college football teams of Iowa State and Drake. 1911, Australian rules football used it in their league. 1911-1912, hockey played in the National Hockey Association required its players to wear numbers on their sweaters for identification purposes. Right around that same time, the Pacific Hockey League also required numbers on the players so they could generate some added revenue by selling programs to the spectators, which was often the case what happened in some of the other sports like football and basketball. In 1916, the Cleveland Indians baseball team, they put numbers on their jerseys. In 1920, the APFA slash NFL used them right from the start uh, to give football that early edge on wearing that. It was 1929, I believe, when the uh, Cleveland Indians and uh, the rest of baseball started wearing the numbers uh, as mandatory in all Major League Baseball games. And, of course, uh, Larry Lester tells us that it was a little bit prior to that that the Negro Leagues of Baseball in their mid-20s were wearing numbers on their uniforms as well, on the sleeves or on the backs. So that's a little brief history on a history of uniform numbers on team sports around the world. And we hope you enjoyed this, and we hope you'll join us back uh, next time for our next exciting encounter with sports jersey history from your friends at the Sports Jersey Dispatch and Pigskin Dispatch. Now I'd like to have you hear a few words uh, from one of my friends that's going to teach us a little bit more about a great player in history. And that would be Joe Ziemba, who's going to tell us uh, about one of the great players that he grew up watching in the Chicago area with the Chicago White Sox. There's another favorite White Sox, me being from the south side of Chicago, and whether you were from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, you had a chance to watch Minnie Minoso play. And... Minnie was born in 1925, we think. Uh, he was the first ball player I talked to. When I mentioned Billy Pierce, I was able to talk to him. I didn't talk to Minnie, but he was uh, kind of a, the voice or the, the appearance, the face of the White Sox after he retired. But he didn't really retire. He kept playing. He came back in the 70s, 1976, and also I I think in 1980 and played, he got a hit actually off a major league pitcher back in 1976. And he had great statistics. You didn't really realize uh, because he played for so long, but uh, seven times an all-star, he batted over 300 for eight seasons, led the leagues in triples and stolen bases three times. And he wore number nine, which was retired by the White Sox and, uh, Ended up hitting uh, with over a 299 average for his career with 195 home runs. And this year, he was finally elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. And so my interaction is somewhere, somehow, there's a picture of me and him when I was about up to his knee. Uh, when he came and he appeared at our end of the season get-together barbecue on behalf of the Chicago White Sox. But I just remember him being number nine as the nicest guy in the world. And it was hard to believe here he was the guy whose picture was on my baseball card and I was standing next to him. So he's my contribution to the number nines of the world. Wow. That, I mean, that's something special. I mean, there's two major leaguers that uh, you, know, you looked up to and you at least got to, to see in person and interacted with one greatly, you know, that's uh that's tremendous when you get to that's every kid's dream to, to see their heroes. Yeah, it was, it was so nice. And, and I said, I didn't really get to interact too much with Minnie Minoso, but just that name, the way it rolls off your tongue, Minnie Minoso. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and we were always would take turns trying to pronounce his real first name, which I believe was Arrestus Minnie Minoso. He came from Cuba and he had that thick accent. It was so cool. But Billy Pierce actually, took the time to help a kid learn how to pitch baseball. And I thought, I always remembered that, that what a, what a neat guy he was for doing that. Instead of just standing there, as I said, that sometimes you'd go to a clinic and you'd have someone talk to you about what he did and this and that, but here he was and he didn't leave. He stayed. He was there for like hours and more than more on one occasion too. So uh, it's nice to see a player give back. 
Thanks, Joe. Uh, that was a great uh, take on Minnie Minosa. No, never saw him play, but I know the name very well. A very famous baseball player in the Chicago area. So we thank uh, Joe Ziemba for sharing that with us today. Also want to thank uh, author uh, Timothy P. Brown with his uh, great uh, Fields of Strife website and his How Football Became Football book where we had uh, some quotes earlier in our uh, broadcast today. Uh, also want to thank our friends at the uh, Sports uh, Reference um, websites, uh, the baseball reference, pro football reference, basketball reference, hockey reference, and Stathead, and also newspapers.com and onthisday.com for all the great information that you provide the world on a game of sports and athletics in history. So we thank all of them, and we thank you for listening to us once again here on the Sports Jersey Dispatch. Hope you tune back to us next time, and follow us on the Pigskin Dispatch podcast and pigskindispatch.com as well as our own website here the sports jersey dispatch.com till tomorrow everybody have a great sports history day sorry but my pitching coach just called time out he's coming out to the mound i think i'm going to get yanked for a reliever we'll see you back tomorrow for some more great sports history on sports jersey dispatch podcast we invite you to check out our websites, jerseydispatch.com and pigskindispatch.com. Not only see the daily sports history, but to experience the preservation of great events and people that play the games. Find us on Pigskin Dispatch. It's also on social media outlets of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel. You get all your daily sports history. Pigskin Dispatch is happy to be associated with the Sports History Network, the sports headquarters of yesteryear, found at sportshistorynetwork.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of the unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row One catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row One Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.